Hello, and I'm going to be introducing uh, uh, the next panel, uh, which will be uh, moderated uh, by Kathy Greenlee, uh, but I'm just going to give some introductory remarks. My name is Richard Cordray. I'm the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, the first director, uh, so far the only director. Uh, <laughs> The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is working hard to make financial markets work better on behalf of 320 million American consumers. In particular, our new agency specifically recognizes the need to protect older Americans against financial exploitation and promote economic security later in life. With the aging of the baby boomer generation, you've heard uh, immense amounts about it today and the effects it's having on our society, that mission has never been more important. Our Office for Older Americans has done much great work around elder justice, the topic of the upcoming panel. Our team has traveled the country listening to older Americans, and based on what we've heard, we've issued studies, guides, and advisories to arm seniors and their caregivers with the information and tools they need to protect themselves and their precious retirement savings. Unfortunately, we've seen that older Americans all too often fall prey to financial exploitation happens all the time. They make attractive targets because they often have higher household wealth in the form of retirement savings or home equity or both. They may develop impaired capacity and they can be isolated and vulnerable. We all know that and see that. Recent studies found that financial exploitation is the most common form of elder abuse, but only a small fraction of incidents is ever reported. So we're calling on financial institutions to do their part to help protect older Americans. The Consumer Bureau will release an advisory later this year to help financial institutions prevent, recognize, and report elder financial abuse. When seniors fall victim to a scam or to theft by a trusted family member, they may be too embarrassed or too frail to pursue legal action or even to report that they've suffered any harm. So it's crucial that others are looking out for them as well. Financial institutions are especially well positioned to prevent such fraud. The Consumer Bureau was born out of the recent financial crisis, and our work is still in its early stages. But as the American economy recovers, we want consumers of all ages to be able to look ahead with hope and resilience. We want them to know they have a new agency standing on their side and looking out for their interests to help restore confidence and trust in the consumer financial marketplace. With your help and advice, we're glad to work with you to do that. This year, as I know the President spoke this morning, uh, marks the 50th anniversary of Medicare, Medicaid, and the Older Americans Act, as well as the 80th anniversary of the Social Security Act. As we celebrate all the benefits these laws have brought to countless Americans, let's not forget that all there is still to do. I look forward to today's discussion, facilitated by Assistant Secretary for Aging, Kathy Greenlee. She has been an excellent partner in this work, uh, the work that we're doing, and a strong leader of the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Are you awake? Yes. Yeah. I decided I'd prefer to stand here to introduce this topic uh, as well as our fine panel, and then I will join them um, and stay seated as we have a good conversation. I wanted to thank Director Cordray for being here. Uh, we've had a wonderful partnership with Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Nora Eisenhower, who runs the older adult section, and Skip Humphrey, uh, who was the first director. I also want to express on behalf of those of us who work on the field of elder abuse and elder justice how profoundly grateful we are that the President mentioned elder abuse this morning. Um, I believe we all think that that's the first time a President has ever mentioned elder abuse. Uh, the significant support that we have in this administration and in this White House uh, not only means a great deal, but we are all very hopeful can move this field forward uh, at the pace that it really needs to move. Uh, this is an issue that I'm passionate about. Um, my friend Bob Lancato, who's out there among us, once introduced me by saying it was in my DNA, and I think that's true. So I wanted to start by telling you a story about a visit I took in California at the end of last year, uh, where I went and met directly with some victims of elder abuse. And I wanted to start this panel by calling them into the room with us. One of the women that I met with was a U.S. veteran and she had been financially exploited by paid caregivers that came into her home. As she described her experience in the emotional toll of the abuse, she cried. And ultimately, she asked me, she said, I serve this country, don't I deserve better? 
I will never forget this woman's face. The woman sitting next to her was the victim of a grandparent scam, where a con artist called her on the phone, I don't know if you're all familiar with the grandparent scam, told her falsely that her grandson was in prison and took her last $10,000. And because she had no money, she was no longer able to visit her family home and her family graves in Texas. And then two people sitting to my right both got tangled up with a crooked financial planner who'd arranged for reverse mortgages on their homes, paid them for two months, and then took off with all of the proceeds from their homes. I talk about these people because the more I do this work, the more I struggle to describe the enormity of the problem. Older people are robbed, beaten, sexually assaulted, and neglected. And I consider elder abuse to be an outrage against humanity because it's an outrage against us all. And the research is scarce. We know that one in 10 older adults will be a victim of elder abuse. If you're talking about financial exploitation, it moves to two in 10. And we know that certain groups of individuals are more at risk, including those with cognitive impairment and those who are socially isolated from others. Elder abuse triples the risk of premature death and victims of abuse are up to four times more likely to be admitted to a nursing home. In 2012, on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, we held an event in this room. And it was the first time that any White House had ever had a convening on this topic. And those of us who were here that day hope that we will all look back and see that as epic as I closed the day. Uh, after we had that event in June, uh, that fall in 2012, we convened for the first time the Elder Justice Coordinating Council, which is a part of the Elder Justice Act, which was passed as a part of the Affordable Care Act. At the first meeting that we convened, HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius came, Attorney General Eric Holder convened the meeting with us, and we have met several times since then. I know that this panel and this council will be the landing place for all of the issues that we raise at this conference that address elder abuse and elder justice, and know with the leadership of Secretary Burwell and Attorney General Lynch that this work will continue. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the strong partnership that we have with our Justice Department, and my colleagues are here from the Justice Department. We would not be where we are, moving at the speed we are without justice, and I would like to actually thank them. I am deeply concerned but I can see progress. I am moved by the formation of multidisciplinary teams working together to address elder abuse. Doctors, law enforcement officials, legal professionals, social workers, financial services planners, and advocates recognizing that ending of elder abuse takes us all. This panel is representative of the national, nationwide interdisciplinary work to end elder abuse. I see hope as we talk about the spread and the diversity of people who are abused, how we address their needs in ways that are culturally competent, particularly for tribal elders, people of color, people who are LGBT, and people with disabilities. And I know that as we do this work together, we will find the ways we need and the responses that we must have to find and turn victims into survivors and help support them and help restore both their resiliency and their trust. Old age is the goal for each of us. We must, what we need most to grow old is to be safe and healthy and whole. And elder abuse is something we should fight because a good old age is simply too precious to lose. I would now like to introduce this fabulous panel. I'm gonna start here on my immediate left, work down the group. Uh, and we will start with Liz Lowy, who um, will, will also give the first remarks. She's a former prosecutor the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where she headed that office's elder abuse unit, where she handled over 800 cases. Since then, she's joined Eversafe, a company focused on the use of technology to help older adults and their families avoid financial exploitation. Next to her, Lynn, we can't, we can't miss you decked out all in white. So Lynn, is the, Lynn Person is the long-term care ombudsman for the District of Columbia, a position she's held since 2010. Ms. Person is a longtime advocate and administrator of programs that touch the lives of older adults. She's currently working on her doctorate in addition to her other duties. Following her, we have James Baker. He's the International Association for the, with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. He has served in law enforcement for over 30 years in a variety of capacities in the state of Vermont and also with national law enforcement organizations. He's currently the Director of Law Enforcement Operations and Support at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. 
And finally, we will hear from Scott Dreeser. I, Dreer. Dreeser. We practiced it. Yeah. Dreeser, and I did it right the first time, from Abilene, Texas. Mr. Dreeser is the chairman, president, and CEO of First National Bank Share and a First Financial Bank, where he's worked for over 38 years. He comes here today as a member of the board of directors of the American Bankers Association and as a member of its Bank Community Engagement Council. So we have decided that we will ask each of the panelists to do some brief remarks, and then I'll ask some questions. We have some from Twitter, and we will ask you as well. So, Liz, if you'll kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Greenlee. And I'm Judith Kozlowski, who I know help with this program. Thank you very much, Director Cordray. Uh, a huge thanks to you, Nora Super, and your team. Everyone's thanked you, but this is quite a momentous day. I'm Liz Lowy. I do now work at a tech company called Eversafe, which is a technology company that protects against elder financial exploitation. And I am former chief of the Elder Abuse Unit at the Manhattan DA's office, where I actually oversaw the prosecution of 800 cases per year just in that county alone. Uh, I was there for 18 years, know a little bit about elder abuse, and I know you do too. Uh, as Kathy said, it covers all different types of abuse. There's physical violence, emotional mistreatment, sexual assault, neglect, and of course the most common form of, of abuse, which is financial exploitation. Uh, many of these cases have different types of abuse happening at once. Most of them go unreported. And abusers often target seniors that have physical challenges or uh, cognitive challenges like dementia. The abuse causes devastating injury and loss, not just to victims, but to relatives and caregivers. As a former prosecutor, thanks, I learned that exploiters of older adults include family members, sweetheart swindlers, corporations, and nameless, faceless, gutless scammers working in boiler room operations uh, and they target vulnerable seniors. And whether the case involved a sophisticated uh, scheme to defraud a senior, like a case that I handled involving the late Brooke Astor, or a simple, straightforward theft, there was usually one common theme. Sons, daughters, or other trusted caregivers in my office, sometimes literally weeping and expressing remorse that they hadn't done more to assist before it was too late. My CEO of Eversafe, Howard Tischler, founded our technology company after his 80-year-old mother became the victim of financial abuse by predatory telemarketers. They thought nothing of selling her auto club services when she didn't have a driver's license, didn't own a car, and was legally blind. She ended up defaulting on legitimate bills, she canceled her long-term care policy, and she lost her life savings. His case is hardly unique. Everyone has a story. You're probably all thinking of one right now. Yet despite the fact that we know that Americans are living longer than ever before, we have blindfolds on with respect, with respect to the tsunami of elder fraud. So the time has come for us to recognize that technology can be an essential weapon in preventing elder financial exploitation. That's why I left, to stop elder financial abuse at its source. Our financial institutions need to enhance technology to detect the schemes that are targeting older clients. Seth Sternberg, I don't know if you're still here. Startups that focus on seniors aren't sexy? No one gave me the memo. Um, in New York City, there was just a FinTech innovation lab where they chose seven companies to work with high-level folks in technology and at financial institutions. These executives all were, were, were helping these mentor startup companies. Two of them involve folks that are concentrating on social service issues. One of them happened to be seniors. As for consumers, research shows that we start to lose our ability to handle our finances in our 50s. Somewhat depressing. But age-friendly technology services can monitor accounts for families. They can report any suspicious activity directly to the senior, as well as to his or her designated trusted advocates, such as adult children, across all financial accounts and all institutions. These trusted advocates can be an extra set of eyes with view-only view access to accounts, so money can't be moved, and that will greatly reduce or even remove the risk that mom or dad will be defrauded while keeping him or her in control of their life savings. 
and their, nest, their hard and earned nest eggs. And what can technology do for those of us working in the aging industry? Big data that's aggregated across a large segment of seniors, institutions, and credit reporting agencies can be analyzed for patterns and anom anomalies. This would provide a, ground, a groundbreaking way to develop predictive models to determine which seniors are most at risk for fraud and for identity theft. An initiative like this would be most helpful to those of us, those of you out here who work with adult protective services, uh, law enforcement, financial institutions, uh, elder abuse shelters, such as the one in Westchester County in New York, like the Weinberg Center, and this data, this predictive data to show who is more at risk for being defrauded would certainly be helpful to folks like guardianship courts, as well as, of course, for seniors and for families themselves. So I thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts on elder justice and how tech can prevent fraud against older adults in the 21st century. We all stand to gain when seniors maintain financial resiliency. And technology can truly be a most valuable tool in our quest to ensure that our parents grow old with their assets and their dignity intact. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Lynn Person. And again, I, like uh, Liz said, just thank you to everyone for making it possible for us to be here today. Um, and it's just an honor to be a part of such an extraordinary conference and that we all have uh, an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of the people that we really truly care about. As the DC long-term care ombudsman and ombudsmen across the country, the role for us is to advocate on behalf of the residents receiving long-term services and supports in our nursing homes, in our assisted living residences, and also in our community residence facilities. Fortunately for us here in the district, our program was expanded in 2012, and we were afforded the opportunity to advocate on behalf of residents receiving these services in their private homes through the elderly and persons with physical disabilities waiver. And one of the things that we see a lot, obviously, is elder abuse um, in the institutional settings as well as in the homes. And it's unfortunate that the abusers, um, and at the top of that list in most instances are families and friends. And one of the things that we do in trying to combat this issue of elder abuse is to provide community education and outreach to our residents and empowering them to understand what their rights are, that they do have a right to be free from abuse. That's an entitlement that we all have. That's a human right. And it's even more important for people when they're relying on other people to care for them. So we have to be very careful also in making sure that our caregivers are educated it. And I know someone mentioned earlier the stressors that um, have uh, the impact on the caregivers that can sometimes put them in such positions where maybe it's not, in, in, it's not intentional that they abuse or that they harm or mistreat the, the older person, but it does happen. And so we think that one of the ways to tackle that is to educate. We believe that excellence in caregiving is essential in assuring that the vulnerable adults live a quality and abuse-free life. We empower the residents um, in ways also in addition to the outreach and education um, and increasing the awareness. We meet with the residents, provide opportunities for them to ask questions and to also make sure that they understand what it means to be uh, free from retaliation. A lot of times residents are fearful of reporting abuse because their caregiver is the one that they depend on so much to provide them with their daily um, activities of daily living and just their everyday life and also that there are other places and other people who can provide these services to them where they can live a much happier and high quality life. We also partner with several community organizations, district and non-district um, entities to tackle this issue of elder abuse, including legal counsel for the elderly, our DC Office on Aging, uh, the Metropolitan Police Department, Adult Protective Services, pretty much any agency in the district who has a responsibility for caring for the elders and adults with disabilities. And one of our recent initiatives which has been very effective is through our Elder and Abuse Prevention Committee and it's called Money Smart Training. And since 2014, we have actually delivered this training to over 2,000 district seniors, their family members, caregivers, and other interested stakeholders within our community who are serious about wanting to prevent and make sure that elder abuse um, you know, doesn't happen in the district to our residents. And one of the things uh, that the training focuses on is obviously to identify, to prevent, and the importance of reporting elder abuse within your community. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm Jim Baker. As uh, I was introduced, I'm the Director of Law Enforcement and Operations Support at IACP. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, my wife said to me the other day when I told her I'm going to the White House uh, to attend a conference on aging, she kind of looked at me and said, well, what would that have to do with law enforcement? And I think that kind of sums up one of the challenges um, when it comes to the abuse of the elderly, that it isn't fully understood the significant role that law enforcement has in providing safety and well-being to our most vulnerable population, one of our most vulnerable populations. And it's kind of ironic, it's the beginning of life that you have a vulnerable population of young children, and, and at the end of life, as we move towards the, the older, the end stages of our lives, that um, it's another vulnerable population. I want to do th three things in, in my comments and uh, save time for questions. I want to touch on a little bit of the work that IACP is doing. The International Association of Chiefs of Police is made up of 25,000 members in 115 different countries. Uh, we're talking about the United States here, but we, we have representation in 114 other countries. And we represent the current leaders of law enforcement today, and we're developing the uh, law enforcement leaders of tomorrow inside our organization. And one of the areas that I have to be honest about and blunt about is sometimes we don't take into consideration this demographic. I'm going to walk away from being here today, going back to the senior staff at the organization and to the elected officials of IACP and talk about this number that's sticking in the back of my head. 10,000 Americans a month are turning 65 years old every month. And that's going to go on. That's going to, a day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, correct. <laughs> It's worse. A quarter of a million. A quarter of a million a month. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to take that number back because that has significant impact for police chiefs across this country. Um, because, again, I'm coming out of a role. I, I, I just came from being a police chief in a small city in Vermont of 16,700 people. We had a significant um, senior citizen population. And it's the type of population that you serve as a police chief that you don't often hear from. Because in many cases, they're resilient, or if they are having problems, they don't know, or they're embarrassed to ask, or there isn't someone there to help them ask for those problems. And what I learned as, in that role, that as I spent my time as a police chief in this city, you've got to reach out to that population as a leader of a law enforcement agency, because it's, it's more than just, okay, they were taken advantage of and it's an unreported crime or there's something going on in their life. There's a prevention model there that we all owe it to them as law enforcement leaders to provide information to them to protect them from being abused. I'm shocked at the number. I, before I um, came today, I spoke to one of my friends that's involved in elderly abuse investigations. And th this is in the small state of Vermont. And I was shocked to learn of the number of unreported incidents of physical abuse of the elderly, the vulnerable population. And it's disheartening to hear that from a, a, from a guy whose mom is 86 years old, who I try to talk to every day on the phone, um, who's doing very well in life, but who has been taken advantage of tel by telemarketers. Not to the extent of what I heard earlier, but when I try to explain to my mother, her son of 60 years old, try to explain to her why she can't be having those conversations on the phone with folks, I, I sometimes get frustrated. And it dawns on me the lack of training for law enforcement about how do you deal with the victimology of the elderly population. It is, it is an area where I don't think we spend enough time, and I'm going to take that piece away from today as well. Um, the final piece that I just want to touch on is that, uh, as I, I heard the mayor talk about Iowa City, I'm going to suspect, Mayor, I don't know much about your city, but I suspect that your city probably has a lower crime rate than most cities. I don't, I don't know this. I'm guessing. The reason why I guessed that was because of the way you described your city being so vibrant. And the fact of the matter is that that population of, of uh, the senior citizens in the community adds such, such an atmosphere of, of knowledge and love for their community I came from Rutland, Vermont as the police chief, and one of the things that I learned from walking the neighborhoods and talking to citizens, there's sixth and seventh generation citizens living in that community. 
and there's elderly folks living in houses than some challenged neighborhoods that they just won't move. Not because they can't move, because they won't give in to the history that they lived in that environment. And I think for a law enforcement leader, um, we have a role in that. We have a role in that um, creating that environment in a city by serving that, that population and making sure they're taken care of. And when they do have an issue, that there's systems in place inside police departments that can support them, that can hear their problem, that can deal with them as victims and make sure they get to the right place so they get some justice in their life. Thank you. Thank you. What an honor to be here. And Nora, I want to say thank you for a job well done. In fact, I've changed your name to Nora Super, to, from Nora Super to Super Nora. <laughs> and uh, I'm here representing American Bankers Association, uh, which are banks all across the country, along with ABA Foundation. Corey Car Carlisle is here somewhere. And uh, uh, we have a partnership with AARP, which Joanne is so important to us, because partnerships are what make it happen. We have got to learn from each other and do it right. And that's one thing about uh, financial exploitation and elder abuse is it's the right thing to do. We have got to stop it and we can stop it. And we are seeing that today in a program that we have introduced in our bank uh, over a year, well, almost a year and a half ago was an elder abuse program because we realized our people didn't know enough about elder abuse. So we educated every person in the bank on how to detect elder abuse and what to do at that time that you detect it because we wanted it stopped then and that's the, the time to do it. And so education went out across the board. Then we made partnerships with the police departments, the uh, adult protective services and the uh, Better Business Bureau in each, in each of the 62 communities we're in. And uh, that part, those partnerships have proven to be outstanding. In fact, uh, they were waiting for somebody to come help them. And the fact that now we're working together because if they see one of our customers have a problem, they come to us. We can put the case together. Or we immediately call them. If we see elder abuse happening, we will call them. They will be at the bank and arrest that person right there in the teller line. So that partnership became very important. Then we started an award called the Fraud Buster Award, which one, when one of our people stops fraud, they get this award. Unfortunately, this award goes out two or three times a week. Believe, believe it or not, this is what goes out on an email, and it tells about who did it and what kind of fraud it was and how they stopped it. And to date, we have stopped over $1 million worth of fraud in our bank. So it's really working. Are we catching everything? No. Do we have more work to do? Yes, we do. The other thing is uh, elder abuse can be stopped by education. And we put a speakers bureau together. We have given over 140 presentations to civic clubs, churches, retirement centers, you name it, if they'll let us come, we'll come talk about it. Because the more we can talk about it, the, the less we'll have. If people know what's going on from the, the grandchild calling and saying, I'm in Mexico in jail, I need, I need uh, money wired to whatever, you know, if people know what, that, what is happening to them and say, I'm hanging up you know, I'm not going to listen to this, or they check it out. It makes a big difference. And so that is, uh, that is part of our deal, is we have got to get out and educate. So that's our program, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you all very much. Well, yes, we're going to ask them a question. I'm going to get to you. I am convinced the nation cares. Everybody in this room cares. Do you all have any other advice for us on stopping it? Any more things that we should be thinking of today as we move forward with regard to prevention? And then I'm going to look to the audience for questions or answers. We'll take answers, too. So let me see if anybody else has a comment on prevention. 
I would just like to add that I think for each of us who has the awareness and the knowledge that we need to share that with at least one person. It's, you know, each person take the information and pass it on to someone else because we have found that to make such a significant difference in the lives of the people that we serve and the people that we're also providing this information to, this training to, and a lot of information they're learning for the very first time and how to respond to some of these scammers who call them on the phone. We have the internet, we call it the dot con um, and those types of scams. And they're very appreciative of the the information and are always very excited to share it with some of their peers. I, I would just like to suggest that, you know, most government is local government and most services are delivered locally, um, that it's important that all the services that are in the community are working together on this issue and that there isn't disparate programs going on because there's strength in numbers and force multiplying makes a difference. If, if I could... Uh, just confirm, I, I agree with that totally. If you're lucky enough to live in a community that has a multidisciplinary team, otherwise referred to as MDT, on elder abuse, it's a good thing. Remember to keep all different groups involved, uh, including financial institutions, because most elder abuse is related to elder fraud. So get to know your local folks at, at banks and investment houses, and get to know local adult protective services, because they go out there, thankless jobs, going, you know, once there's a call, not just with seniors, but with other adults who have issues, they're out there really facing this head on and work with APS and work with law enforcement. Doesn't need to end up in an arrest, by the way. And I said that when I was a prosecutor also. Some of the greatest cases we had did not end up with an arrest in a trial. It just ended up with the victim getting help, the victim being moved to a safe place, like a shelter at a nursing home, perhaps you're lucky enough to have one, or the victim getting their money back in criminal court. You can get your money back in criminal court if the judge orders it. Then the victim doesn't have to go out there and hire a civil attorney to sue, because they're already out there money because it's been stolen. I just want to say a lot of people think that only rich people uh, have elder abuse. That's not true. Let me tell you, it goes across all disciplines. I, I went to a low income group to say, I would like to present to your group. And they said, we don't have that problem. I said, yes, you do. Let me tell you, because I watched, or after the fact, unfortunately, because we could have stopped it, and this is one of the reasons we started in this program, one of our customers lost $40,000, everything she had, and then some because the fraudsters had had a run of her credit cards. And that was everything. So it does happen across all walks of life. Okay, so I see some, uh, Wilson? Wilson has the yes, mic. Yes, uh, my name is Wilson Wewa. I'm from the state of Oregon, the great state of Oregon. Um, I also am one of two tribal members, a part of this conference. I have been probably the forerunner in helping tribes to acknowledge that elder abuse exists, uh, like the gentleman said, in all walks of life. And elder abuse to me is the pink elephant that nobody wants to see, like alcoholism and homelessness. Recently, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, along with the National Congress of American Indians, passed resolutions to ask for financial help from Administration on Aging and the Justice Department to come up with a sur survey tool for the 566 tribes that are served by NCAI to get data for tracking elder abuse so that we can ask for more funds for our police departments, for our senior programs, for our advocates, to do a better job in battling elder abuse. Also, we could use partners like universities, federal agencies, and researchers to develop a survey tool so that we can successfully take care of this. We're talking about partnerships helping one another, and I ask for these partnerships to help solve these problems for Indian country. Technology is great. I come from a rural area with little towns like Fossil, Oregon that none, nobody knows about with 25 people in them. We have reservations that have no electricity so therefore we don't have um, technology. So we need to solve 
getting computers technology to the rural areas, not only in Indian America, but also into the rest of rural America. Wilson, the, it's terribly the, rude for me to interrupt. You, I know I it to, is. Yeah, do you have a question or can I ask the Well, I just want to make a statement. Yes, I just want to say I, I'm asking for help for those areas and we need to be cognizant that we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know where my mic runners are. I will make a comment just briefly, and we're going to take a couple more, that I do meet with uh, tribal programs that we fund, and elder abuse comes up at the top of the list. Uh, Mr. Wewa and I have discussed this issue before as a concern. Um, Judy, ha could I talk to Judy and then Elma? And remember, I've got a left side over here, too. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I'm Judy Stein from the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Uh, thank you so much for this whole day and for this panel in particular. Uh, a very close family member of mine uh, lives in another state, and um, we were very shocked to find out that uh, she had accepted help painting her apartment and getting her car repaired to the tune of $24,000. The small apartment's entirely wallpapered, and uh, she was no longer driving. So further to that, it help happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able uh, to do something about that. But what we also found, and these are two of my questions, was one, there were cognitive issues that had been able to be um, washed over. And it led us to realize how they had get, gotten away from her um, in terms of her capabilities. And the second is what, uh, so uh, do you, f I think that these issues help you see other problems that you have been trying not to see sometimes. But my real question is, is that, if that's a question, uh, uh, how to deal with, if you have tips for people who care very, very much about people who are not nearby. Um, and that, that is, I think, an increasing problem for our older people and the people who really do care about them. Thank you very much. As I said this morning, the financial institution is normally the first place that sees that uh, somebody has dementia. And I have made the call many a time to family members to say, you know, you have a problem. And getting them convinced that there's a problem is, is a problem. Uh, in fact, it, uh, you know, sometimes I have to call and say, we got to take the checkbook away. And I'm the one that does it. And they literally w will not do it. I have to sit down and say the checkbook's got to go to a family member that you trust and that will take care of you because it's not happening. And unfortunately, uh, it shows up in the financial part first. And so you just, you gotta take a stand and you gotta move because you cannot wait. Because if you wait, the problem gets worse. Listen. Listen, yeah. Lynn both have and other bigger banks won't call and tell you that because of privacy regulations because they can't, and they'll, they'll file a suspicious activity report, but they can't call you to say there's trouble. But technology reaches across state to state. We heard that earlier about the uh, gentleman, I forget his name, but he was great talking about in-home healthcare through technology. We, we know that there's technology that can help family members and caregivers keep an eye on each other. It's not always about the senior. Sometimes it's about a parent for a kid going to college. But technology is the answer here. So at the first sign of erratic activity, you as a close, trusted friend can be notified. And I just also want to mention, I know ARP is also with their age-friendly banking initiative, also focused on this problem and doing a great job. I would also add, if the person is in a long-term care facility, you can always contact your local ombudsman program within that particular state if you don't live there and let them know that you have some concerns because there's routine monitoring visits that are made to those facilities all the time. And I don't have an answer to the problem, but it may make it worse, but make it better in a conversation. I think one of the challenges we have and what you just described is the disparate way abuse is reported from state to state. And I think that's a challenge that has to be on the radar screen. Every state has an elderly abuse investigative unit that looks a little bit different. Could I call on Elma? Does, do you have... I must recognize Elma's incredible contributions to improving the care of people. Um, uh, I, uh, there is another elephant in the room, and it's barely been mentioned, and that is uh, the uh, abuse and neglect that continues in our nation's nursing homes. 
and there's no way to answer, ask a question and have it answered here, but I, I, I want to remind all of us that we have a national nursing home reform law that is outstanding. It's one of the best laws that's ever been passed in this country, a civil rights law, and it's not being implemented. And people across the country everywhere are asking, why aren't we implementing the law? There are wonderful nursing homes and wonderful nursing home care in our country, but thousands and thousands of people still are denied good care. We have a wonderful nursing home resident leader here in the audience with us, Brian Capshaw, and I want to recognize him. Um, he's right there. Uh, I wish he could say something as well. I'm going to run out of time, Elma. Elma and I did have a chance this morning to talk about the CMS will be issuing new regulations on long-term care facilities. Can I just so. give a plug-in for the Ombudsman Program, which was born here at the White House yeah. by Dr. Arthur Fleming? <laughs> it needs expanded and, and improved and strengthened. Thank you, thank you. And that's the program that Lynn is representing today. Let me do one, I think I can do one more. And then, um, I'm sorry, I've got to go, to, yeah, I'm sorry. Dan Zeth, someone run a microphone and whoever gets a microphone to someone. That's kind of like where I am. Dan Rango. We do that way. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, first of all, hats off to you, Kathy Greenlee, for your passion for elder abuse Thank and making you. it a national Thank issue. You. Thank you. I'm, I'm Dan Reingold from the Hebrew Home and River Spring Health in New York. Uh, I, I wanted to just bring up a, a connecting the dots, and that is that we spoke this morning about uh, a place like Walgreens uh, bringing public awareness to elder abuse. We heard earlier from the city, from the Meals on Wheels folks, uh, training our Meals on Wheels delivery people to get behind closed doors and, and acknowledge and, and, and discover uh, elder abuse. My question really, it goes to uh, one of Liz's comments and to our financial folks. Why can't we loosen up some of the confidentiality laws in the banking system so that bank tellers can identify when the money, when un uncharacteristic withdrawals are taking place, which are clearly because of fraudsters, and step in in a way that'll protect the, uh, the elder adult, older adult without causing any liability to the bank or the financial institution? We, we trump privacy when a crime is going on because we feel like it is more important and you know, you've got, you've got to report it. It's like any crime and so we report it. Uh, and you know, if, if you see problems, I don't, you know, the family expects us to call. Uh, it's less, just like anything else. And I have never yet had somebody come back on me and scream privacy when we're doing the right thing. And it's always the right thing. Oh, Terry wants, I, I just need to recognize all the rest of you here who are experts that have been helping us raise the profile of this issue. I have to wrap it up because we really have more people. Look at your agenda now. We have more people, but I know that there are 600 places around the country watching. And this is my last opportunity to ask the nation my three questions. Do you know any older adults who are abused? The answer is yes, because I gave you the data, one in 10, two in 10 if it's financial. Do you know who they are? It's a very hard question. How do we find them? And do you know what they need from you? If we all do what other people, older people need from us, regardless of discipline, as represented here, as represented in the federal government, we can create the national movement we need to stop it. So thank you all for joining me. Thank you all for your support.